Welcome back. It's time for our very first hot topic, and we'll be taking a look at Nigeria's debt burden on citizens. And uh, we have as our guest, Mazi Sam Ohuabunwa, OFR, founder and former CEO of Nimet Pharmaceutical, 2023 presidential aspirant. He's an economist, and he's joining us this morning to take a look at this burden that Nigerians are afraid to carry. Good morning, Mazi, and welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning, Nigeria. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks be to God. Well, Mazi, before yesterday, Nigerians have been talking about the borrowings of this government, the huge debts on the economy. But yesterday, Monday, uh, the headline on the Guardian newspaper kind of helped us uh, uh, to, to break down these burdens, to see just how much debt is hanging over the head of every Nigerian. And according to that report, uh, 17,800 was what I was owing, you were owing, with regard to the public debt uh, under President Obasanjo. But today, under President Muhammadu Buhari, you are owing, I am owing 368,421. Not forgetting the Nigerians in the villages and all across uh, the country. First of all, do you think that we should be worried, or are we just crying wolf, Mazi? Um, well, uh, I think we are not crying wolf. We should be worried um, because sometimes Nigerians, uh, especially our leaders and, and public servants, try to cajole us with uh, comparative statistics. We use them when they are convenient for us. And then we debunk them when they are not convenient. We will say this is not America, this is not UK. But then we use those uh, comparisons. Now, when it comes to debt to GDP ratio, if we compare ourselves to the rest of the world at about thirty-five percent or so, we are we are we shouldn't really be if we come to GDP to debt ratio. However, the worry is that if you look at GDP to uh, income, uh, debt to income ratio, hmm. or debt, uh, debt repayments to income ratio, you become worried because today the money Nigeria is making is some hardly enough to pay our debt that is due. C uh, capital and interest repayment is almost equivalent to the entire money we are making from oil, yield, from entirely generated revenue, and everything. So that is where the fear is, because it is not that you have a large population, you have the capacity to produce more, but you're not producing. And when you can't pay your debt, you might get to the point, one of the years, I can't remember which year, it was clear that we need to borrow money to pay our debt. We borrow additional borrow, uh, uh, additional borrowing to meet our debt obligation as they fall due. So the painful is that all the money we make as a nation today, we pay them as debt. So we now borrow. To, at some point, we also borrow to pay uh, recurrent expenditure. So that is where the worry is, uh, and, and 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 I hear Nigerian. Um, ministers, uh, minister of finance, talk about our problem is revenue. Yes, our problem is revenue. Sort out the revenue problem or cut your quota according to your size. Mm -hmm. If you must borrow, then borrow on what you can be sure you generate income from immediately. But when you're borrowing to pay social, uh, social uh, uh, welfare, borrow to give money to, to, uh, to transfer to uh, poor people, that is not a um, reasonable boring. We are taking unnecessary risk and not getting the future of our country. Yeah, this also brings to question uh, what the forces at the root of shaping Nigeria's debt profile could be. Sorry? I said this also brings to question what yeah. the forces are at the root of these borrowings. The two forces are one, poor revenue collection and irresponsible expenditure. You cannot be spending money like this outgoing regime as if money was not a problem. 
all you are saying is that I need to spend money on this thing. So what do I do? I don't have enough revenue. So what do I do? Borrow more. If I can borrow, print more money. Borrow from central bank. If central bank is not producing enough, we borrow from foreign banks. You know, this is not the way to do. We agree that this country needs uh, a huge uh, uh, investment in infrastructure, even in social services. But we have advised that government should seek and check what it means it can do with its resources, which, to our opinion, is in the area of improving security, improving healthcare and education, the social services. Then we invite the private sector to come and invest in capital development. That way, you still achieve infrastructural growth without putting a dead body. I'll give you an example. We build the rail line. I remember I was a member of the Shaw P when uh, President Jonathan began to build the rail, the standard rail gauge between Kaduna and Abuja. Mm. Now, that rail line was being built on 70% loan from China uh, uh, Export Bank. Nigeria's contribution was 30%. So at the end of the, of, of the body, like we have finished it, we are in China. And we are going to be paying them both loan and we are going to be paying them also the capital repayments and interest. Meanwhile, the, the train stations are not operating. The train line is not running. So we are not even generating money from the rail line. And here we are paying, going to pay the interest and pay the capital. I have suggested, why not ask China, China, come and build this road line with your own money. And then we give you 25, 30 years to recover your investment through tolling or through charging fares. At the end of 20, 30 years, the infrastructure becomes, becomes Nigeria's. Who cares? Who build the rail line? What is important is that we get the service. Yes. But rather than do that, we go and take a loan. The loan we don't have, we have not properly dimensioned our financial and cash flow to be able to meet the loan requirement. So we're just we're just taking one loan to pay another loan. That's where there's a mismatch. Yeah, that is, is why it is very yeah. That's why this very crucial question about the forces at the root of this borrowing because the states are owing. And then yeah. the federal government is owing. And then you look around, you do not see the benefits of this debt, these loans that are being collected. Inflation has risen. Nigerians are suffering. And, and what concerns do you have about incoming government? Because here we are, uh, there is the fear about default in the repayment because we can't even service these debts well, meaning that the incoming government will not even have enough capital to implement development. Both at the well, state I, and at the federal levels. Yes, I think it's a big burden we are, we are going to give to the incoming government. And I, I do hope that they will not be as profligate as this government. This government is profligate. What I mean by profligation is that you are spending above your earning power on a consistent basis for the eight years. It, 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 does, it's not, it doesn't make sense to me. What I think the the incoming government ought to do is to reprioritize. Yeah, everything is good to be done, but we can't do everything at the same time. More so when we are not having enough revenue. So state governments, uh, federal government, reprioritize. That is number one. And then do complete cost saving. I'm not hearing this government do any cost saving. I'm not hearing any rationalization of of uh, parallel and multiplicity of MDAs that have been long recommended. Streamline government, you know, reduce expenditure overhead. Yes. This government, one good thing that this government has done, in quote, is because they don't worry about money. So they fund, they, they are funded more budgets than many people. Their, their budget performance is better than the past because money is not an issue. There's no restraint. But that is not the best way to run government you prioritize and then you cut down cost and then seek the creative ways to raise revenue raising revenue doesn't mean you need to punish your people or increase taxation on duly there are many creative ways you can raise revenue first increase the tax net expand it find simple ways to make everybody contribute little months little payments and they'll participate 
Number two, a, a promote enterprise development. It is when you have enterprises developing. Those inter enterprises will pay uh, taxes. The employees will pay taxes. And therefore, you get more money on revenue. You expand opportunity for investment in flow. Let investors, both domestic and foreign, come. Because when they come with their investments, investments will not create businesses and projects. Businesses and projects will create jobs. Jobs will create wealth. And wealth will drive away poverty. So you are increasing your tax net through increasing productivity and investment. You're also helping Nigerians to be employed. So you're meeting this, this same uh, issue. Instead of taking money and giving to people that you're not sure who gets it mm -hmm. and what purpose it's serving, you let people get jobs. And that is making the place investment friendly. The government should focus on in making their, whether they are state or federal, their environment friendly. And to do that, just three things. First, ensure there's law and order and safety. Two, have stable policy uh, framework. Don't change your policy day and night. And thirdly, introduce incentives. By, the, by, by doing those three, you will attract investors, domestic and local and foreign, and you can grow your economy create more wealth, create more revenue, and you can do more projects. Well, uh, uh, Mazi, uh, a while ago we had uh, Chris Kendongwando, who is a, a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, who joined us on Off the Press uh, to look at the headlines. And one of the things he suggested is that the Constitution be amended to enable states own enough, you know, to boost uh, IGR. Do you share this uh, thought of his? There is enough right now for even local government to regenerate IGR. It's just that we don't have creative and innovative leadership. We don't have a leadership that is driven to increase productivity and income generation. There is enough for local government. We don't need to amend any budget or any constitution. Yeah, constitution, we agree we need to do more decentralization. We need to, we need to uh, 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 give more power to the um federating units that i agree but i am saying that that is not what is holding us back there is enough provision in the in the constitution for for the i live in my village the road to my to my house is not is not graded it's not clean every season i have to go and make it otherwise the place is eaten up by erosion i am there by the time i come back i i i, I do things for myself what of you the local government just came and graded that road and they put, even if it, even if it says, Mazi, you are graded your room, you should pay this money. All the people living on this your street should do this. There's no service. There's no water. There's no electricity. They can put a ball or reticulate it and begin to ask you to pay for, for it. They are doing nothing. The, the local governments are collecting money, share, share, share to staff, share their own to political office holders. They go back and wait for the next uh, money to come. Nothing is going on at local government. At the state level, whether there is rain, there is sunshine, whether there is farming or there is plenty, the moment fact comes, the state governor takes his his um, his security vote front line. It doesn't matter whether salaries are paid or not, and he takes all the money that he needs to take and the money that those around him need to take, and they just move on, and 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 be watching us in, in amusement. Whereas there are too many things states can do today, today, without changing the constitution, to be self-sufficient. There is no competition among states to attract investment. Hmm. They are allowing their even state uh, indigenous to go elsewhere and invest. What will stop? What will happen if Anambra State, Imo State, Abia State, all the Southeast states decide to turn their states into investment heavens? The first one that they will benefit are the uh, diaspora uh, people living outside the southeast. They are willing to come home, but they come home on government. Uh, there, uh, the roads are not done. There is no cleanliness. The roads are dirty. The environment is dirty. Nobody cares for you except when they are moving. They move on with twelve or thirty vehicles in their protection. They don't care about the ordinary citizen. How do they want investment? So it is not constitution only. Constitution will help, but if they continue to behave this way, Constitution will not make any difference. Constitutional amendment.
Yes, yes. Chris also did allude to the fact that we already have, we have arable land, we have enough crops that this government, I mean, the state governors could, you know, invest in to boost the economies of their various states, even as he clamored for that uh, constitutional amendment of a sort. Uh, we are in a democracy, Mazi. Uh, these pictures you've painted are quite gory and sad, but they are the reality. That, that's what we see playing out across most of the states in the country, if not all, except for maybe Lagos and then one or two others. The disconnect between the leaders and the lead, in spite of all the loans that they've collected. Um, how do we reverse this trend? How do we see a change in this narrative? Because in a few days from now, 13, 14 days, a new government will come in at the federal level and even in some states. How do we begin to see a change? And what can Nigerians do on their own to hold uh, governors accountable. Uh, let me remind you of a time when we had the Tongozi Okonjo Uwela who publicized allocations to states so that citizens can begin to engage their governors as to how allocations were spent. Well, you're right, uh, Menno, that we have, we have responsibility on both sides. In my book, Nigeria Need for the Evolution of a New Nation, I wrote in a chapter the leadership, the fellowship that, de that deserves the leadership. The fellowship that deserves the leadership. If the, if the fellowship is is um, docile, unconcerned, you know, then uh, the leadership will also be docile and unconcerned. But if the, if the, if the fellowship is demanding for accountability, somehow they force the leadership to be more accountable. So it goes that way. Uh, but what we believe is that we are looking for leaders who do not need on due pressure to be accountable. We are looking for leaders who have conscience, who fear God, who know that leadership is an opportunity to be of service, to serve God and man, and that you are accountable to God, your creator, and also to man, but more to God even than to man. So, but that's what we are looking for, leaders with conscience. If we can get them, then things will happen better for us. We are looking for leaders who are empathetic, who have a feeling for the suffering of the masses, who share their body, not pretending to show show or shedding crocodile tear, who have passed through where they are, are too and can identify with their issues. That's the kind of leaders we are looking for. And we are hoping that 2023 uh, has offered us an opportunity to enthrone those leadership at both national and sub-national level. And I'm hoping that uh, 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 at, the, at the national level, we will we'll have a model of a president who will model how a country can be run. And the moment that modeling is properly done, then it is easier for people to look at him, like the state uh, governors, to go to leave because they say people behave as their leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want, first and foremost, to have these leaders who are consensual who have shown competence in their past activities, who have shown character that they are able to be trusted, who have shown that they have competence and also that they have vision. Because if you have character, competence, and capability and you have no vision, you just be a good you just be a good follower. If they ask you to do a job, you do it well. But to be a leader, you must be visionary. You must point the this the, the, the direction. You must determine the end point. So I'm just really wishing that our leaders, as they come on in the next couple of weeks, will first start with agreeing on a vision for their states, for their for the national. In four years, where do we want our our country to be? Where do we want our states to be? One, GDP contribution to the economy. Two, per capita income. What will be the per capita income by each individual? Three. What will be our educational ranking in the state or nationally? What will be our healthcare ranking in terms of infant mortality, maternal mortality, life expectancy? You know, we set those goals because it's those goals that will drive us, not just responding to, to things. When we set these goals, we can determine, okay, what kind of resources do we need to achieve these goals? It's at this time we do the planning. First year, second year, third year. They will ask ourselves, do we have the resources? We say no, or we don't have all of them. So how do we achieve the resources? We begin to plan for internal generation. We begin to plan if we need to borrow. 
we begin to begin to plan for private pub, public uh, uh, partnership. We begin to plan for franchising, for 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 giving up, uh, asking people to come and take certain responsibilities and do it on behalf of government. And government can even pay them uh, a, a small charge instead of even putting the burden. Instead of government trying to do it and doing it in the most inefficient manner. Yeah. And then you. when you do businesses, you can do face payment. Even with private sector, you don't have to pay everything at once. Thank so, by so doing, you, re you reduce the debt burden. Borrowing money to pay 100% for everything or pay part of it is something we must do as a last resort. Thank you so much, Mazi Sam Ohuabon. It's such an honor to have you as our guest this morning on The Breakfast. Thank you so much for your insight and depth on this matter. Mazisam so Ohuabunwa OFR, founder and former CEO of Nimet Pharmaceutical, 2023 presidential aspirant and an economist, has been our guest this morning as we considered Nigeria's debt burden on the citizens. Do stay with us, we'll be back to take a look at our second hot topic, which has to do with technology in agriculture. <laughs>